How high can we expect the South African Reserve Bank to go on interest rates? And what's the outlook for inflation as the country battles tough economic times? Hello, I'm Jeremy Maggs. This is No Ordinary Wednesday, our in-depth look at what's driving markets, shaping the economy and changing the game. Now, the Fed has hiked interest rates to the highest level in 16 years as it battles to rein in inflation. The European Central Bank following suit hiking by 25 basis points. In South Africa, local rate hikes are having little impact on bringing inflation down to within its target range of 3 to 6%. All eyes are on the Reserve Bank Governor, Lesetja Chanyajo, and his Monetary Policy Committee as they prepare to meet later this month. In this edition, Investec Chief Economist Annabel Bishop will help us navigate these stormy waters and provide some clarity as to what we can expect over the next few months. Annabel, a warm welcome to No Ordinary Wednesday. Annabel, let's start with this then. Despite recently announcing its 10th rate hike in 14 months, the Fed Reserve Chair Jerome Powell hinting that it might be the last increase for a while. So here's the question, in fact, two. Will South Africa follow suit? And are we also reaching something of a turning point as far as the interest rate cycle is concerned domestically? Yes. Hi, Jeremy. It's a very big question. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll answer it in a few pieces. The reason for that is that um, South Africa has still got a big difference between the rate of increase in US and South African interest rates. In other words, the US has increased by 5%, South Africa only by 4.25%. And that really means that the risk premium between South Africa and US interest rates has been eroded, if you see what I'm saying, the interest rate differential. When that happens, you get substantial pressure on the RAND to depreciate. And of course, it's come at a bad time. It's come over the past 12 months when global financial markets have already seen an elevation in risk aversion. So risk or financial market players not keen to buy risky assets. So that's really the concern here. South Africa needs to make up lost ground, in other words. And of course, you know, what we have found is the United States has signaled that it's, this is possibly the end of its interest rate hike cycle, reaching what is known as the terminal rate or, you know, last um, rate hike in the cycle. And and of course, it has left the door open for further hikes if it needs it, but it's not expected. U.S. interest rate expectations in the market, so actually for cuts for the remainder of this year. For South Africa, and I think also you know in the ECB, the ECB has said that it's hiked interest rates, when it hiked interest rates recently, said that it's likely to hike by more this year. So you can see monetary policy um, likely to become disjointed. For South Africa, of course, we're still in May and we are going to probably follow the U.S. bond interest rate hike. And of course... Um, um, the U.S. hiked by 25 basis points. We could hike by 25 to 50 basis points. Our forward rate agreements, the market expectations are somewhere in the middle at about 33 basis points. So South Africa should hike by another 50 basis points, which would obviously put pressure on the RAND to strengthen. That would be the correct thing to do to widen the interest rate differential between South Africa to reduce the erosion of the, this risk premium. And of course, that would then result in some strength in the RAND, given that markets haven't fully priced in a 50 basis point hike and just a 20 basis point hike so far. Our expectation is that the Saab may choose to do 50 this month. Let's build on that lost ground argument, Annabel, if we can. So with the announcement being made next month, what specific variables then will the MPC be taking into consideration when they make that decision, whether it be 50 basis points or not? I think they'll be fairly concerned about the inflation rate in South Africa. We target CPI inflation, which is at 7.1%. And while it came down last year from the peak of 7.8% in the, current, in the current inflation cycle, it reached 7% by the end of last year and then 69 in January, it then jumped up in uh, February and March to 7 and 7.1%. And of course, that's going to cause some concern to the Reserve Bank. In particular, I've noticed the Reserve Bank, uh, and, and if you look at the speeches by its government, Governor Lesetja Kanyaga recently, he's talked a lot about the increased pass-through effect from currency depreciation into inflation, particularly the impact of brand depreciation against the dollar on higher food prices in South Africa, higher food price inflation, in fact. And of course, food prices are key to inflation in South Africa. They make up the largest component of the inflation basket and in fact are the biggest driver of inflation. So I think, you know, the currency's depreciation plus the high inflation, the fact that core inflation is 
well, while not targeted by monetary policy in South Africa, is still um, quite important to the Saab. And by core inflation, we're talking about normal inflation, excluding food prices, uh, transport costs and energy costs. And of course, you know, that also um, having elevated recently. So the, both of those measures are above the 4.5% midpoint of the inflation target range. And I think, you know, the Reserve Bank is going to be quite concerned about that. The uh, Reserve Bank's mandate is to get inflation back into target. What the higher than expected inflation figures in the first quarter of this year have done, the jump back up to 7.1%, they've pushed the point out at which inflation regains target. So inflation is now only expected to reach that 4.5% in the second half of next year. And again, that also puts pressure on the Reserve Bank from an inflation targeting perspective because inflation targeting is forward-looking, particularly 12 to 18 months out, but really over a 6 to 24-month period. I think the Reserve Bank is going to look at a number of factors. They also look at GDP growth, which of course they have revised down to 0.2% for this year at the last meeting. But that's heavily as a consequence of the fact that South Africa is seeing higher stages of load shedding in South Africa. We also, in fact, have a 0.2% forecast this year for GDP growth, which we calculated on looking at an average of stage five load shedding for the year and what that would subtract from economic growth. The Saab would say that the impact of load shedding on GDP is not something it can control and therefore would not be something that would be a a reason for it not to hike because it would be worried about growth. Could it be higher than 50 basis points? You know, you've hit the nail on the head there in terms of, you know, unpacking this. It should be 75 basis points to close the gap. So both the US and South Africa have a 5% hike each in the current cycle. You know, I saw the ECB, the the, the members were tilted. Um, Obviously, they came out only a 25 basis point hike, but uh, that's what they were tilted towards. But, But there were quite a few members, you know, arguing for a higher, for a 50 basis point hike. I think I think we'll see the same. I think we'll see quite a few members arguing for 50 basis points, maybe a couple for 25. I would imagine 75 basis points is too rich for the Saab. But of course, under T. Chambawini's stewardship as governor, it would not have been. It's the unpredictability, Annabel, which, which you referenced. So you've already spoken about uh, stubbornly high inflation, load shedding. You talk about uh, stage five. In fact, we've seen some predictive models saying, you know, maybe even stage eight during the course of the winter. It would appear that that uh, monotonous regularity of stage six is already with us, certainly as we record this podcast. And obviously the challenges as far as Transnet is concerned, weakening commodity prices. Are you seeing any hope at all? So yes, you're quite right. Um, we do have severe instances of stage six. I think um, we're looking at an average for the year. So if you were to take all the stages and you would average them out, we're looking for stage five for the year. Interestingly, though, recently we lost so many megawatts off the grid that we actually approached stage eight load shedding. Now, of course, there's two things with load shedding. It's both load shedding um, clients, but also load curtailment, where large companies, particularly uh, manufacturers, are asked to reduce their electricity usage. Now, if you think about a smelter, that's not something they can do in Instantly, they can't suddenly switch off and switch on because of the negative impact it would have on the machinery. But if you ask them to do it the next day, that obviously is something they could do. So load curtailment plus load shedding together gave us over 7,000 megawatts uh, removed from the grid that day, which would have been um, you know, a stage eight load shedding if it obviously had not been for that load curtailment. Why I've gone into this technical detail is it shows you know, the dire straits that the grid is under. And of course, yes, stage eight load shedding is a risk for winter because as demand ramps up and supply is insufficient, then you'll levels of load shedding ramp up. And, you know, that's really the key point here. I think also, of course, as well, the other factors of production, which are also negatively affecting the economy, particularly on the freight side, insufficient rail and port capacity. So those are worries. We also have seen as well that despite the substantial rand uh, weakness over the past 12 months, it was at 14.50 to the US dollar in April last year and reached 18 50 to the US dollar this year in April, despite this very substantial rand weakness. Now, this year has not seen an improvement in the terms of trade for South Africa. It's actually seen a deterioration. So the rand weakness hasn't benefited our trade. And partly that's because of the loss of productive capacity that we've actually seen in South Africa. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. I would like to remind you that a new episode of No Ordinary Wednesday drops every fortnight. Please don't miss it. Subscribe to Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the channel, please take a moment to rate us. Let's get back to the RAND in just a moment, but uh, just in terms of the scenario that you've painted for us, this does not bode well for short-term investor or business confidence, does it? 
Well, I think, you know, that, that, that's really the crux here. And if you look at business confidence, it's actually been depressed over the course of the past decade, also this decade as well that we've, you know, newly entered into. For investor confidence, of course, you can see the negativity. Um, investors obviously looking either into safe haven investments, and that's typically U.S. treasuries or other safe havens, or of course, into these stronger emerging market currencies and assets. For South Africa, our credit default swaps are very elevated, evidencing the high degree of risk. Our carry trade, we're at actually the bottom of the ranking for Bloomberg's emerging markets. It really just means that our interest rates are not high enough to entice investors. And of course, as well, over and above that, there are the domestic risks that are seen as a consequence of load shedding and the other factors I mentioned. If we look a couple of years out, we do see the substantial build program of energy generation take place, particularly in the renewable space, but also a new energy generation coming through from the mining sector when they look to become self-sufficient. And of course, the impact of the increase increased uh, solar usage in households, etc. All of those things obviously are expected to see a big improvement in electricity capacity, as well as um, supply, yes, in terms of the other renewable projects and increased electricity build over the next several years, which will feed onto the grid. So reduction in demand from self-generation, increase in supply. I think we're obviously really approaching a worst um, capacity period this year. And from next year, there is expected to be an improvement, certainly, but not to solve the situation, but the following years, yes. So, Annabelle, you referenced the weak rand. What type of currency trajectory are you looking at then in the short term? So, with the US um, potentially reaching its terminal interest rate, the um, highest level of its interest rate in the current cycle. And for South Africa, um, really expected to see potentially one more interest rate hike of 50 basis points, if not another one down the line. We think the RAND is actually at a point where it's probably going to stabilize. We've seen the RAND around 18.30 to the dollar for the past couple of weeks. Interestingly, though, Jeremy, part of that has been some dollar weakness. And of course, you know, the RAND's actually depreciated against the pound and the euro. So this problem of eroding our interest rate differentials, of, of it causing RAND weakness, lowering the risk premium in South Africa, Africa, that's now feeding through into other currencies. Let's not forget as well that other countries, as they see high interest rates, such as Eurozone, they, of course, then attract more investment there as well. So we think the RAND could stabilize and dip somewhat lower but into the 18 to 750 mark. But we don't think that there's much potential in the first half of this year, and of course, even in the second half, of it gaining substantially beyond that. The reason, of course, as well, is that there's still a great risk in terms of global recession or certainly a slowdown in global economic activity. Already, we've seen in Europe that the GDP figures coming out in the first quarter of this year, last quarter of 2022, have actually been close to stalling, if not contract. So, so these are all obviously concerns that we've experienced in South Africa and globally as well. We cannot move away from the fact that what happens in the global economy and global financial markets obviously has a feed through effect into South Africa and therefore also, of course, as well into our currency. So, you know, moving into a global recession or, or further global slowdown environment, expect in the second half of this this year would obviously have a negative impact on the currency from a risk averse perspective. So the recession side of this is, is is a given now, is it in the second half? So I don't think it's a given. I think it's seen as, as a realistic risk. If you look at financial markets, they haven't fully factored in as a recession. What I really think is that the Reserve Bank will be running out of time not to hike interest rates in South Africa in order to protect the RAND, given that the risks on the horizon. I think, however, that for South Africa as well, we need to be mindful of the fact that we have seen quite a hard in a sharp interest rate hike cycle. And that's also also coming through in terms of the consumer finances. We've seen increased vulnerability of consumer finances over the past few quarters. And obviously, this is having an impact on both the equities market and the bond market, particularly the bond market is skittish right now. You know, I would agree. And of course, you know, there are worries as well, particularly for South Africa about deteriorating government revenues. Every year, um, you know, the past several years, we've, um, if you were to exclude the COVID year of 2020, we've often had significant revenue overruns, which of course tend to make it much easier to absorb big increases such as over budgeted increases on the civil servant front from a salary and wage demand, you know, other unexpected expenditures. This year, the risk is that we actually see a revenue underrun. We don't 
didn't come in with more money than we thought we would. Look, SARS continues to perform very well and, of course, continues to make improvements in efficiencies and collection. However, with the great risks of South Africa's GDP growth slowing to 0.2%, if not obviously seeing a contraction for the year as a whole compared to last year, as we move above an average of stage five load shedding for the year, that then has a, quite a negative outlook for our revenue collections. That, of course, is being reflected partly in the bond market. Of course, we've also seen you know high interest rates having an impact there. But let's not forget high inflation as well. You know the the inflation trajectory that was reversed earlier this year that obviously has going to put some pressure through on the bond market there as well. So really, I think you know we we are seeing these risks come through. Our equity market does tend to follow quite closely in terms of what's happening on in international equity markets. And of course, you know having been in, in, in large in a risk averse period over the past twelve months, that's obviously had a significant impact as well. So no disagreement there on how tough it's going to be in the second half of 2023. And what's the outlook beyond that 12 months hence? I think next year, the general outlook, the expectation certainly is for the global economy to pull stronger, for South Africa's economic growth also, of course, to see improvement as well. Much will depend on the resolution of the constraints in our logistics and freight system, of course, as well, electricity capacity and supply there as well. We do move into an election um, period next year, which obviously does push through through heightened political uncertainty and can obviously have a negative impact on consumer and business confidence. From a global perspective, I think that um, you know the markets are right to worry that if we do move into a global recession, certainly a US recession, that we would obviously look to see interest rate cuts in the second half of this year. And that's exactly what the um, Fed funds implied futures have actually factored in. So, so we're sitting in an environment where we really are experiencing a very long period of uncertainty. I would say that the volatility has come down quite a bit in financial markets. I was looking at it this morning and the volatility for the RAND, for example, is much lower than it was in September last year. I think we're almost treading water in a um, depreciated space and a risk averse space generally for financial markets and obviously waiting for some type of directional driver to come in to really give us an impetus to move forwards. Hopefully we see stabilization and then improvement. Always insightful and to the point, Investec Chief Economist Annabel Bishop. Thank you for joining us on this edition of No Ordinary Wednesday. Please join us again in a fortnight as we continue to explore money trends shaping your world. If you haven't yet added us to your podcast feed, search for Investec Focus Radio SA wherever you get your podcasts and hit the subscribe button. Until next time, goodbye from me, Jeremy Maggs, and the entire Focus Radio team. The views expressed are those of the contributors at the time of publication and do not necessarily represent the views of the firm and should not be taken as advice or recommendations. Investec Limited and subsidiaries, authorized financial service providers, registered credit providers, and long-term insurer.